Chapter 1080, The Legendary Hero. So it starts off, we learn that Kobe escaped. He's still on the pirate island, but he escaped his holding cell. He has like a ball and chain attached to him, limiting his movement. So he can't just run out of there, skywalk out of there. He's kind of limited to what he can do. He's being chased by an angry mob of pirates and they're holding a bounty poster. So we learn Kobe's bounty from Cross Guild is five stars or 500 million berries. Each star is worth 100 million berries. The pirates actually mention that this is unusual and that the average captain bounty is only one star. So there's a couple reasons Kobe could have earned such a high bounty. First, Mihawk being a founding member of Cross Guild, he was also at Marineford. We know Mihawk has a tendency to see the best in people and see what their potential could be. He did this with Zoro in just a single fight. Since Kobe had that observation hockey uh, spectacle, I think Mihawk could have noticed his potential in that field and seen his true strength, which would make sense for why he was awarded such a high bounty. Also, we know Kobe was obviously involved in the Rocky Port incident, which we don't know much about, but Cross Guild being such a large organization could easily know what happened there and give Kobe a high bounty according to what he did there. So Kobe did not only escape alone, he actually brought the other slaves Blackbeard was holding along with them because we know obviously Kobe is a good guy, a true Marine, and he wouldn't be able to just leave anybody behind just to save himself. So something that stuck out to me, these guys are all praising Kobe for saving him. And off panel, one of these guys actually calls Kobe a saint, which it's not too weird because we know the meaning of saint is just obviously a good person. But with the revelation of Saint Jay Garcia recently, and we know the other Celestials, that is a part of their name as well, Saint. I think it's kind of interesting seeing as we don't know where Kobe came from. We don't know his parents. So we've seen what Oda has done before. It's possible that this is some type of foreshadowing and maybe Kobe somehow has Celestial blood. I don't want to look too much into it, but just putting that out there for you guys. After that, we see that Shiryu and Pizarro are on the island, which is interesting because now we know it's pretty much narrowed down that most likely Katarina Devon, Lafitte, and Alkizia are the ones in that ship at Egghead. And we actually learn these members' devil fruits. So we knew Shiryu had the invisible fruit, but Pizarro's fruit is revealed to be the island island fruit. And we see him speaking through the floorboards, his face emerging from them. Also, Vasco Shot has the glug glug fruit, and he's known as the liquor man. Personally, I think that fruit is just kind of mid. Um, liquor, liquor, that shit sounds ass. Okay. All right. Can we move on? All right. Can we well, please listen, move on? Well, listen, listen, Can we listen, please move listen, on? Listen, listen. What, what? So Vasco Shot wants to actually burn down a bunch of the island until he can, you know, find Kobe and kind of burn him out. And this is interesting because Pizarro says no because the Rocky Port was just repaired. So something that happened almost two years ago, the incident involving Kobe, the port was just repaired now. That's pretty interesting, kind of showing the scale of exactly what happened there, if it took them that long to repair it, especially seeing as Pizarro could probably do it pretty quickly with the island island for him being able to assimilate with the island and uh, move things so easily. So we learned that San Juan Wolf has the big, big fruit, making him a gigantification man. I also just wanted to say that his epithet, the colossal battleship, that kind of sounds to me like a Frankie matchup right there, the colossal battleship. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see them clash in the eventual matchup between the Straw Hat Pirates and the Blackbeard Pirates. Then we cut back, Kobe running from the Angry Mob, and we start a flashback where Blackbeard actually reveals his plan to Kobe. So Blackbeard's plan is actually to trade Kobe in to the world government in order for Hachinosu, Pirate Island, to become a full-fledged nation. Blackbeard states that he's fine with being under the rule of the world government but we've seen him play multiple sides before so this is probably a small part of his large scheme uh same thing with how uh being a warlord was actually just get him into impel down get his crew and then go to marine Ford and ultimately kill whitebeard steal whitebeard's devil fruit after learning this information from blackbeard kobe actually tells blackbeard that he's a member of sword and this plan would never work and Aokiji standing beside Blackbeard has a weird reaction to this and I'm not sure exactly what this could mean. He just tilts his head to the side and there's an exclamation mark. So I'm not sure if he's shocked, confused, or what. But he's definitely thrown off by Kobe revealing this information. And Blackbeard's not even aware of what the sword organization is. So Aokiji actually has to explain it to him. And this dynamic is 
really interesting seeing as we know that Aokiji is possibly a double agent working to take down Blackbeard from the inside. So Aokiji actually explains to Blackbeard that Sword is a group of Marines who have already turned in their resignation papers. So if they do anything that were to blow back on the world government, they could be cut off the leash at any time and the world government will leave them out to dry basically. Um, this was kind of shocking to me because I think most of the community believe that S.W.O.R.D. was not known to the average Marine and that it was more of a secret organization, but it actually just turns out it's a subset of Marines that are working outside of the Marine Code and in case there's any blowback on the world government, they can be let go at any time. I'm not sure how I quite feel about that. I kind of liked more the angle of them being like a secret organization rather than just a subset of Marines, but we'll have to see how Oda plays that out. Uh, most people, including myself, believe Aokiji is a double agent working to take down Blackbeard from the inside, and it almost seems as if they both know what each other's planning. And in this dialogue, they're kind of sneak dissing each other. After Aokiji explains what Sword actually is, Blackbeard even refers to them as rats and says some would even gnaw at his fingertips. I don't know if he is just trying to kind of call Aokiji out slyly, but we cut back to present day and learn that Kobe was actually freed by Perona under the condition that Kobe would save Moria from a lower level of the prison. We then overhear some pirates yelling that Marines are attacking. And funnily enough, Kobe blushes at this fact. He can't believe that they would come to save him. We know Kobe is pretty important and likable among the other characters. So to us, it's not a surprise, but it's funny how Kobe reacts to it here. So after that, we actually get introduced to some powerful sword members. And personally, this is something I've been looking forward to because one flaw I thought Oda had in the story is that a lot of the Marines were not powerful enough at all. And other than admirals, once you start to go down the totem pole, none of them really interested me at all. None of them scared me. I felt that if you send them to an island, nobody's going to really think twice of if you're a top echelon of the pirates. Obviously, any of the bums would be scared of a vice admiral, rear admiral, but no supernova, no Yonko, no commander would even think twice if a rear admiral or admiral came here. And I think this is probably Oda's uh, attempt to kind of change this narrative here. The first person we meet is Navy Rear Admiral Kujaku. She's the granddaughter of Suru, and she ate the Whip Whip Fruit. This gives her the ability to tame anything. First, we see her doing it to buildings, so that means she is able to control even inanimate objects with this, and that's just honestly broken. That makes zero sense at all. Uh, if she can tame a building, could she tame a mountain? If she could tame a mountain, could she tame a tree, an island? How, where does that stop? Um, I think it's a pretty cool ability. Next, we see Navy HQ Commander Hibari. Uh, she seems to be a sniper, but it could just be something with weapons when she's more fleshed out. But as of now, I think she's specifically a sniper. She's using uh, Vegapunk weapons. It's actually the the bullets that we see in the cover story with Vegapunk and Caesar and Judge. Because she shoots the pirates chasing Kobe and turns their bullets into flowers. Also, a side note here is she has the same dialect as Akainu and they speak the same. She speaks kind of country. And these are the only two people who have the same accent or dialect. So I'm not sure if there's some daughter, niece, cousin possibilities. As we see in this chapter, Suru's granddaughter. Could this possibly be a kind who's granddaughter or daughter? I'm not sure. We'll have to see on that. My favorite introduction in this chapter is Prince Groose. So Groose actually appeared on a cover page. I think it was somewhere in the 900s. But it's actually revealed that he's a clay clay man who has a squelch squelch fruit. So this chapter he's shown making golems from his hand that he was able to control to start the assault. They were cut down and were able to easily just get back up and keep fighting. And they almost looked human to a certain extent. Um, it's not confirmed here whether this is a Logi or not. I think this could be more of a special Paramecia similar to uh, Katakuri. But... It's also possible as a Logia because he's shown here making the clay straight from his hand. Groose and the rest of the members basically get it set up, start the assault so that there's a space cleared. Garp's ship jumps from the ocean somehow, similar to the Sunny when they do their liftoff. And as it ships in the middle of the air, Garp actually jumps off doing his first named attack of the series, Galaxy Impact. And he is like 50 meters in the air, nowhere close to the ground. And everything is just breaking under his punch. Buildings flying. And this scene confirms his Conqueror's Hockey. Which, you know, being at that tier, we basically could assume. But actually here, it being confirmed is kind of crazy. Seeing as, you know, during Marineford, even when he was so angered by Akainu, we didn't even see it there. 
So when their assault first started, Garp was actually just kind of laughing and joking around. As he's punching, he refers to Kobe as his beloved protege in the future of the Marines. Obviously, I think this is cool. I love Garp, but I know exactly what some of you guys are thinking. Why the fuck did Garp not do this for Ace? That can't be. You being serious? <laughs> I didn't stop the... From the feet we get in this chapter, I can pretty much look back and say if Sengoku wasn't there, Garp would have fucking killed Akainu. It's crazy that that little action from Sengoku saved Akainu and kind of changed the whole trajectory of the manga. Because Garp could have killed Akainu there. Yeah, guys, this, this one was crazy. Especially... Coming off the chapter we just did with Shanks, straight into another chapter, another powerful character reveal. Finally seeing the true strength of Garp. Um, Oda was not lying in his messages of this ultimate battle royale. But another thing I wanted to end on is just the fact that Shiryu, Pizarro, and Vasco Shot are here along with San Juan Wolf. And we know who's with Blackbeard at Winter Island. So that leaves Lafitte, Aokiji and uh, Katarina Devon that could be going to Egghead. So it makes sense. That's kind of an infiltration squad. We've seen Lafitte infiltrate the world government to tell them about Blackbeard. So he's slick. Aokiji, we know he's powerful. And Katarina Devon, obviously with her fruit and her ability to uh, disguise herself. So we could possibly have, you know, Aokiji clashing with Kizaru at Egghead. So there's a break this week. So when we come back, I'm sure we'll tap back into Egghead, see who arrived there, confirm that it's Aokiji. And from there, I'm sure Kizaru and Saint Jay Garcia will have arrived at the island. All right. Thanks, guys. That's it.